Good morning. My name is Susie Brown. I'm the Public Policy Director here at the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits, and we're delighted to have you join us for this morning's webinar on how a bill becomes a law. First, I'd like to just provide a brief overview of our public policy work at the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits. We support individual nonprofits and Minnesota's nonprofit sector to be their own voice in the public policy process. And we provide training on advocacy and lobbying and serve as a resource to policymakers on the nonprofit sector, advocating on issues that impact all nonprofits, such as incentives to charitable giving, nonprofit tax exemptions, lobbying rights, and election activities. We're pleased that you've decided to join us today to learn about how a bill becomes a law. One of the um, things that you may all have in common is that you may have heard or seen Schoolhouse Rock in the past, and for today's training, we'd like to apply the basics of how a bill becomes a law to the specifics of the process in Minnesota. In addition to myself, for the presentation today, I'm joined by my colleague, Renal Ray. Good morning, Renal. Good morning. This is Renal Ray. I'm the Public Policy Advocate at the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits. Today's learning objectives are as follows. We'll review the general steps required for an idea to become a bill and then a law. We'll discuss the variations and nuances of the process. We'll learn about the ways that nonprofit organizations can be involved in the process. To begin, Renal will start with a description of how your idea gets turned into a bill. And I will pick up the conversation from there on how a bill moves through the legislative process. We'd like to invite you to, as Michaela said, type in your questions into the chat box throughout today's presentation. And we'll also take a pause for questions after the part about drafting your bill and before we talk about moving your bill through the legislative process. So. All bills generally, actually really, start as an idea. And these idea generators can be anybody in the community. They might be your neighbor, they might be a business owner, they could be your kid's teacher, a lawyer, or a doctor. Really, anybody can have an idea that can be turned into a, to a bill, which can be turned into a law. And often, nonprofits that work in the community that have a specific mission to either end homelessness or work on youth development or promote arts and culture will have idea, ideas that turn into laws um, based on the work that they do in community through their programs, through working with community members, and based on the needs that they're seeing and the barriers that the community members that they work with are facing. So one example that actually comes from Schoolhouse Rock of an idea that started in the community was this idea that school buses must stop and look both ways at railroad crossings. We know that happens now. We've probably been stuck behind a school bus that has to stop at a railroad and look both ways. Um, a long time ago, I'm not sure exactly when, that was just an idea. And we'll walk you through that example and how it might become a law. So all bills start with an idea. So that's our idea. Let's run our idea through these questions. Um, what do you know or what information do you have that leads you to your idea? Well, we might have data. We might have stories. We might have anecdotes on the importance of our idea and what the impact it might have in community. So we might have seen a school bus that sped through a railroad crossing when there was a train coming. Um, and didn't see it, or there might have been a horrific accident um, that led us to this idea. So the next question is, what will your idea change or do, and what impact will it have? Um, obviously, we want our idea to become law and something that every school bus has to do in this example. Um, so how many bills, this is a question for you webinar members, how many bills do you think are introduced in any given legislative session. Please type in your answer into the chat box. Take a guess. So far the answers coming in are in the hundreds 
Oh, somebody has responded in the thousands. The answer is actually in the thousands. Last year alone, there were over 3,000 bills introduced uh, during the 2014 legislative session. So there are lots of idea generators out there, and those ideas, those th 3,000 ideas were turned into bills. So we're going to take our idea, and we're going to then start talking with people who care about the idea. So this is really important because um, you want your idea to be the best formulated and well-developed idea to move through the process. So part of what we do in this process is think about, well, who are natural um, people that might be interested in the idea? Who cares about it? Um, who are going to be your partners and your collaborators? We do that a lot in the nonprofit sector, and that also applies in our policy making and our advocacy initiatives. Um, so we we want to, sometimes this is where coalitions are formed, um, and coalitions are really just people and organizations that come together around an issue or a specific idea. Uh, current examples of coalitions at work right now are Mini Minds. Last year there was a coalition around raising the minimum wage called Raise the Wage. Um, Restore the Vote is a coalition that's active this year. So these are sometimes diverse and unique and unusual suspects that come together because they all support the same idea. Um, so one of the things that you might do with these people that you're working with is share, share with them or source from them the stories and data that they might have access to that support your idea. Um, they might also bring different skills to the process and to the idea to help move it forward. It's also really important to understand at this point is there anyone that disagrees with you? Can you anticipate what their opposition might be? And why do they see the situation differently than you? And this can be helpful as you think about and continue to develop your idea to make your case stronger, to um, have a better sense of what to anticipate later down in the process as well. So where does your idea fit into law? So this is kind of thinking about this as the research and fit phase. It's important because it guides where your advocacy is focused. Um, you want to figure out, well, is there a current law that um, indicates what the situation should be? So we would probably look into what school buses are at this point required to do when they get to railroad crossings. What does the current law say? And is your idea, maybe there is no current law. So your idea might be con entirely new. And where does it seek to, where do, where do you want it to fit into existing law? What is the right level of jurisdiction? Is it something that the federal government would have jurisdiction over? Is it something that the state decides? Perhaps it's a local government issue as well. Um, and so figuring out kind of where your idea fits into law is really important to do so you narrow the scope or you better understand the scope of where your advocacy would be focused. Um, and this is kind of important because you don't want to waste your time, your capital or your effort in advocating for a state level change that's really a local government issue um, when it's a local government that makes a decision or vice versa. Understanding this helps you narrow in, the, narrow in on the work that's ahead. So the next part of the phase is, so you've got your coalition that supports school buses stopping at railroad crossings. Um, you've kind of done your research and figured out where your advocacy should be focused. Let's assume for the sake of our example that our advocacy is focused at the state level. And then next what we would do is try to find a legislative champion. And this a legislative champion is really somebody who is excited about your idea and thinks that it would make for a good law. And it could, that person could eventually be the, the chief author of your bill that carries it through the process, but it also might not be. How do people find, leg, or organizations find legislative champions? Well, the first question to ask is, who do you know? Uh, maybe it's somebody who's a friend of your organization, a donor, could be a neighbor, a personal neighbor of yours. Um, it could be the person who represents you as the advocate or 
um, whose district your organization works in. Um, and it could be somebody who cares about the issue. Yesterday I was in a committee where there was a bill up about um, youth recreation. And there was some banter in the committee about how the chief author was looking for the coaches and the referees and the legislature to sign on to the bill to become an author. So where are the natural interest areas within the legislature? So who might care about that issue? And then who serves on a strategic committee um, or in a strategic position? So this could be um, you know, something that you also think about as you're thinking about your legislative champions. Um, so once you have a better idea of where your, fit, your law fits in, where your idea fits into law, you find your legislative champion. So can you guess, or perhaps you know, how many choices you have? How many legislators are there in the House and in the Senate? How many potential legislative champions are there? Please type your answer into the chat box. Another way of asking this question is how many members are there in the House and how many members are there in the Senate? We've got some answers that are coming in close. So your pool of potential legislative champions is 134 in the House and 67 in the Senate. Um, so some of you are getting really close there. So working within those like 201 people to find a legislative champion. So one of the things that you want to think about in being is to be strategic and how you find and pick your legislative champions. So you might go to the person or the legislator that represents your district and pitch your idea, share the merits of your idea, and they might say, I'm really interested, I want to sign on but I'm in the minority this year, or my caucus is in the minority, you might talk to representative so-and-so who's in the majority and might be interested. So that's another way to figure out how to be strategic in figuring out who your legislative champions could be. And the reason that you do this is because only legislators can turn your ideas into bills. So what will your idea do? As I just mentioned, legislators are the only ones who can introduce bills. So it's these 201 people. And they are the ones who have the authority to have a bill drafted. And so they often work with the revisor's office, Senate or House counsel, and the department staff. So as an advocate or a nonprofit organization, we would work with and through our champion or our chief author to have our bill drafted. Um, you can do this in a few ways. You can share your idea with your legislator, your champion, um, or the revisor's office through your, through your champion and kind of share the gen generalities of the idea, share the impact that you'd like to have, um, why you think it's important, where you think it fits into law, and then the staff can figure it figure out how to draft the language. Another approach might be to propose specific language for staff to consider. And this could be something that's important if um, you were working in a coalition where there was a lot of differences of, of opinions, or you know that the opposition to your idea will agree with the language that's drafted in a certain way. So for example, in our um, school bus stopping at railroad crossings example. Let's say that there was um, opposition that said that school buses should stop 100 feet away from a railroad crossing. And you really think that it should be 50 feet away. Um, but you were able to work out a compromise that was 75 feet away. And that was something that was important. And you know that that's that's the thing that would get your bill through, you might suggest to your legislative champion and to the drafters that that's something that they keep in mind as they draft. So I'm going to hand it off to Susie now, and she's going to walk us through once our bill is shaped into, once the language is shaped into a bill. What happens next, Susie? Thanks, and all. I will start shortly talking about where it goes in the process next, but I'd like to invite you to type in questions if you have them 
about the process that Renal described, which includes generating your idea, talking to others, figuring out how the idea relates to current law, finding a champion, and getting it drafted. One of the things, uh, if you have specific questions about those things, please type them in. Another thing that we invite you to do is type in questions or just write a word in the chat box if there's terminology that we're using that you don't understand, because this is an area where um, language matters and sometimes words are used in different ways than in the general public. Any questions at the moment about getting your idea into a bill drafted form? One of the questions um, that might be of interest is, where does it fit in current Minnesota law, and how could we figure that out, Renal? What kind of information could help us mm -hmm. determine where this fits into current law? Yeah, if you're not sure where it should fit, I think talking with your legislative champion or your legislator is a really good place to start. They might refer you to the reference library, um, which is in the state office building, that you can communicate with through email or to show up in person. They're really helpful and can help you figure out the answer to that question. And in addition, the reference library can help you figure out where your idea fits into current law, and they can also help take a look at the history of whether an idea like this has been introduced before and what was the fate of that proposal. And is there a resource you can suggest, Renal, for figuring out who serves on strategic committees? Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, so I think the best resource for figuring out who sits on what committees and which one might be um, helpful to you is by taking a look at the legislative website. There's a lot of information either by legislator or by committee that indicates um, who is the chair of the committee, who is the committee administrator, and who serves on that committee. Thanks, Renal. Great. And we have a question from Maureen about what is the best way to connect with a champion, by phone, by email, or maybe through a visit. And really, I would say that any of those ways are appropriate and all of them might be necessary. Typically, if you're going to build a relationship with a champion where you're going to work together to move an idea through the process, it'll be very important that you establish an in-person relationship. Whether that's your first connection with that person or not is probably dependent on a lot of things. If that's your own legislator who you know from the community, perhaps you go out to coffee with them. Um, if it's not your own legislator but it's somebody who serves on a strategic committee, perhaps you call their legislative assistant and ask for an appointment and maybe have something prepared to leave in writing with them. So when you go in for that appointment, they know what you expect to talk about. Um, I would suggest that possibly phone meetings and emails would be the way that you might communicate with your legislative champion as the issue is unfolding in real time. You know, like we're, we have a committee hearing tomorrow, do you have the testifiers, that kind of thing. Um, but that really getting some face time is going to be important to be able to work through the issue from the beginning. Thanks for that question, Maureen. Please do feel free to type in additional questions as we go, and we'll stop for some and save others for later. The next step is um, having the bill introduced. Excuse me. Yes, having the bill introduced. What will your idea do? Okay, uh, we're on the right page here. So when you, when you have your idea turned into a bill, um, you're going to be actually seeing a product um, which is the bill in written form. And I want to call your attention to a, a language thing here, which is that um, what that's actually called is jackets. They say, we have the jackets for this bill. Um, the bill's ready and jacketed. Basically, that means that there is a hard copy of the bill. Everything happens at the legislature in paper. Um, the, lots of communications happen electronically, but, but bills happen in paper. So that means that the bill is sufficiently drafted, it's done, it's ready to go, and it has a wrapper around it um, that is called the jacket. And there's a process that needs to happen starting with the jackets, which I'll explain. Uh, and, and it may be that you're in charge of that process or it may be that somebody else is, but it needs to happen nevertheless. The first thing to do is think about getting additional support 
it's unusual that a bill would make progress through the legislature with a single author, even if that person was a great champion. It's important to think about getting additional support in a bipartisan way and in a way that includes people who are on strategic committees. So there are people who are for the bill as it goes through its process and from both sides of the political aisle. Additionally, bills need to be introduced in both the House and Senate and move through those processes together. They don't have to be exactly concurrent, but a bill should be introduced in a similar way in both the House and Senate and move through the process that way. So as your bill gets drafted, somebody, maybe you or maybe somebody else, will actually hold on to these things they call jackets, which is the bill in drafted form with a wrapper around it, and go to the people who you think are strategic additional authors and ask them to sign the bill, sign the jacket. And that means they're signing on their support. And then we do something called sending it to the hopper. And I'd just like to call your attention to the little picture in the upper right corner. The hopper is a basket. That's it. There's a basket in the House and a basket in the Senate. And the thing that that person is holding in their hand is a jacket. And you can very vaguely see at the top it says H period, F period, and then there's a number. And that says House file whatever, 368. So that's the, the title of your bill. That House file is the number of your bill, and then there's a description of it. And below that, you'll have the signatures of the chief author and the other authors of your bill. And then you drop it in the hopper. You literally just drop it in the basket, and that's where it starts moving through the process. Okay, when it goes to the hopper, then it's picked up in the House and Senate by the clerks of those bodies. And the clerks will refer the bill to a committee, and they will introduce the bill through something called first reading. So your bill, after it goes in the hopper, you should watch for it to have first reading on the House and Senate floor, which means it's officially started in the process and it has been referred to the committee. So they could say, for example, in Renal's school bus bill, House File 1, a bill relating to school buses, has been introduced and referred to the Committee on Transportation. That's what you'll hear about your bill. And then you know that your bill is going to the Transportation Committee, and that's where you should watch. But as you can see in the slide, this should not be a surprise. As you've been working with your champion, your chief authors, maybe the reviser's office to draft the bill, there will be a discussion about where the, where the bill will go to what committee, so you can start doing your work with that committee. There's a question uh, coming in about, is the process in the House and Senate done at the same time? Uh, sort of <laughs> is the answer, maybe, ideally. Um, things move at different paces in the House and Senate based on all kinds of things, priorities, um, politics, timelines. The House and Senate really operate as separate bodies, and um, even when they're held by the same political party, they don't necessarily organize their times, the, their timelines and their activities to be concurrent. So the best practice is to get your part of it done, the bill drafted and the bill introduced, getting your champions and getting introduced at about the same time. And then you really need to watch it move through the process, and that could be um, looking very similar between the House and Senate, or it could feel like they're moving at a really different pace. So it depends is the answer. The next stage is that it will move to the committee process. And so in the case of Renal's bill on school buses, we have moved to the Transportation Committee. It may be that there is one committee hearing in each body, and when I say body, I mean House and Senate, or it may be that there are several bills in the House and Senate. I'm just gonna pause for a second. There's another question about, so you need champions in both the House and the Senate? Yes, that is correct. You need a champion in both the House and the Senate. That's the best way for this to move through. So the next thing you need to do is prepare in both the House and the Senate for committee hearings. In the committee, 
you, your bill will be presented by the author, your chief author, in both the House and the Senate, and will often have testimony by the public and perhaps yourself. We'll talk in a minute about preparing testimony. One thing to consider about the committee process is that your bill might move as what's called a standalone bill, which means that it is all by itself. So House File 1, Renault's bill on buses, says we're going to require staffs at railroad tracks, and that's all. There's nothing else related to that bill. Or it may be that your bill is considered as something to be included in an omnibus bill, which is a common practice in the state of Minnesota, particularly related to bills that are um, finance bills or have money related to them, where the committees will wrap a bunch of ideas into one bill. So yours may start as, a, as an independent idea, and as you get to the committee process, it may be wrapped into a bigger bill with lots of ideas. Don't worry about that. It's very, very common. As you're getting ready for the committee process, whether it's going to be a standalone bill or potentially in the omnibus bill, there are several things that you should do to prepare. The first is discuss your idea with committee members. It's good to have a feeling about the committees of whether you have majority support, unanimous support, very little support. The way you do that is you talk to the members of the committee. And to discuss your idea with the committee chair. The committee chair controls which bills get a hearing or not. So you can make an appointment with the committee chair, or you could talk to the committee chair's staff person called the committee administrator, and you can make a request that your bill be given a hearing. Of the 3,000 bills introduced last year, this is a quiz run all. Do you know how many got hearings? I do not. I do not. Anybody on the phone, if you know how many bills got hearings last year, you can type it in. We don't know, but what I'll tell you is that many, many bills don't get hearings, so you have to advocate that your bill will get its time in committee. Also during this time, you need to keep in close contact with your chief author. That is the person who's responsible for shepherding it through the process. Although you may do lots of work to make sure that it's moving, that is the person who ultimately will be presenting the bill in front of the committee. It's important throughout that process that you support them in whatever they need and that you thank them. Additionally, be prepared to arrange testimony and support for the day of the hearing. The day of the hearing comes, and it's time for you to be prepared with your testimony. The first thing, probably stating the obvious, is you need to be prepared to tell the committee what you want them to do. Are you asking them to vote for or against your idea? Renal, are you asking the committee to vote for or against House File 1? I'm asking them to vote for House File 1. Great. And it's quite possible that there may be somebody else asking them to vote against House File 1. As you're thinking about your testimony, it's important to determine what is the unique information that you have that will influence the committee to do what you want them to do. It may be that you're a school bus driver and you've seen close calls. It may be that you're a nonprofit that does um, after school work with kids and you have some point of view on this. It may be that you're a transportation expert. In any case, you have unique information that led you to have this idea and it's important that you think about what is it of the unique information that you have that will compel them to do what you want them to do. It's very possible in this part of the preparation that you will have far more information than is useful for this point in the process. So we recommend that you determine two to four main points that support your position. Sometimes this is really hard because we know all the research, we've heard all the anecdotes, we have strong personal opinions, and we want to tell the whole story. This probably isn't the time to tell the whole story. It's the time to be clear and concise and make two to four main points. You're welcome to follow up with committee members and have private meetings with them and talk to them more about what you know but you run the risk at this stage in the game of losing their attention if you're not focused and clear and concise. We recommend that you plan two to three minutes of testimony around your main points. In general, that's an amount of time that will hold the attention of the committee. And in addition, for some issues, particularly those 
that are controversial or have many people in the public interested in testifying, it's possible that the committee may limit your testimony to that amount of time. It's discouraging and nerve-wracking if you've prepared 10 minutes of testimony and when you sit down at the testimony table, which is nerve-wracking in general, they say, please limit your remarks to two minutes and then you have to adjust. Um, so we recommend that you start by just assuming that you'll have a very brief time to testify and that you should plan short testimony around your two to four main points. For many people, it's very useful to write it down and practice. We recommend that because it's a very, it's a nerve wracking situation and for many people, it's the first time they've done it. So writing it down and practicing can help you feel prepared. We also recommend that you visit the committee in which you'll be testifying before the hearing. It's very interesting to go to legislative committee hearings and see how the committee process works. There are standards for committee processes in each of the committees in the Minnesota legislature in both the House and the Senate, but committees are run by people and people have individual styles and committees have different feelings to them, some very formal, some less formal. Also, if you visit committees, you might observe that the committee members' interactions with members of the public can differ from their interactions with each other, with the legislative staff, with professional lobbyists, and with members of the department or administration. They tend to be very kind with members of the public, as is very appropriate, um, but it, it's interesting to observe how their interactions differ depending on who they're talking to. Learning the cultures and conventions of interacting with the committee is very important. If you visit them in advance, you'll see and observe things like how you introduce yourself when you sit down at the committee table and the fact that you need to sign up on a list after you've spoken in case they want to follow up with you for additional information. Watching the process will help you understand the culture and conventions. And then you need to sign up to testify. In some instances, you'll hear that a committee chair will say, is there anyone else in the audience who would like to testify on behalf of or in opposition to this issue? And one way to testify is to raise your hand and stand up right then and go do it. But in this case, this is your bill and you're shepherding it through the process. And signing up to testify in advance will help you be prepared and it'll help the committee and the other people attending the meeting know that you're planning to be testifying on that bill. After you've signed up, you can sign up to testify a couple of different ways. One is to call the committee administrator in advance and to let them know that when this is up for a hearing that you would like to be on the list to testify. Another way is when you get to the committee hearing, you can mention to the page, which is the person who staffs the committee and helps the public, you can mention to them that you would like to be on the list to testify. Susie, there's a question. What's a good rule of thumb about how many people are invited to testify during a hearing? Thanks. That's a great question. And uh, again, like many things in this process, it depends. Um, there, are some, there are some issues that are really controversial and you know, really substantive changes for the state of Minnesota where the general rule is anyone who wants to testify may do so, even if it means days and days of hearings that run until midnight. Recent examples of that would be the proposal to increase the minimum wage and the proposal to extend marriage equality in Minnesota. Um, also the bill that was commonly called the bullying bill, there was a more technical word for it. So, so the, for those kinds of um, testimony opportunities, it's really unusual that they would limit the number of people who testify, and it's highly likely that they will limit the amount of time that's allowed to testify. Most bills are not that um, engaging to the public, and typically there would be maybe two or three or four people on each side of the issue. People aren't technically invited to testify by anyone in an official position. Typically, they offer themselves up to testify. It may be that, that somebody calls you and says, we'd like to understand your position and your expertise. Could you please testify? In which case, I highly recommend that you say yes. Um, but mostly, if people want to weigh in on a bill, you shouldn't be waiting for an invitation from anyone. You should just assert yourself and call the committee and say that you would like to testify. I think it would be very uncommon that there would be a limit 
to who could testify on any particular bill, but some are much more um, popular among testifiers than others. I, so as an advocate trying to get school buses to stop at railroad crossings, would it be appropriate for me to organize some people to come and share their ex experience and expertise? Yes, well, actually it would be very important for you to organize people to share their expertise and also to organize people to just be present for the proceedings. It's very common, especially with nonprofit advocacy type issues where the public is engaged, um, it's very common that you may be very be strategic about how many people we want to have testify. Let's say an expert, a parent, a bus driver, a school teacher, and a researcher, something like that. So you may work with your committee, excuse me, with your legislative champion to say, who are the most, what, what are the most strategic voices, and let's make sure that we have those people lined up so that all aspects of this issue are covered. But then you might say, actually, but we have 100 people on our list who support this issue. So you'll say, great, we're going to get buttons made that say school buses should stop at crossings, and we're going to invite all those people to come and wear their buttons and sit in the committee hearing room as observers because the committee certainly watches and recognizes if there's a wide range of support in the room for an issue, even if all those people are not testifying. Please do feel free to type in additional questions about testifying. I'm going to move on to following the bill's path. The bill could go a variety of directions. One is it could pass the committee as a standalone bill and be sent to the floor. And in a minute, we'll talk about the floor. Another and quite typical path is that it could pass the committee and go to another committee. In some instances, a bill has multiple jurisdictions, policy jurisdictions. In other instances, a bill gets a hearing in a policy committee and then also needs to be heard by a finance committee if there's money involved in the, in the uh, passage of the bill. So very common that it goes to more than one committee. And don't forget, this is happening in both the House and the Senate at the same time. Another option is that the bill could be what's called laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. What that means is that the committee hears your bill, they do not take a vote, and the committee chair says, we will lay this over for possible inclusion in the transportation omnibus bill. And that means that this issue is being considered to be wrapped up into the big bill at the end of the legislative, at the, at the end of the committee work. Another option is this bill could be stalled in committee. It could feel like it's an incomplete process. One way that it can stall is that you never get a hearing, either because the committee chair has decided they're not interested in your bill, either for policy or political reasons, or because the committee runs out of time, because the legislature needs to adjourn at a time certain, and they also have internal deadlines around if a bill hasn't been heard by such and such a date, then it's dead for that legislative session. So you could find that it is stalled. And you could also find that it's defeated in committee. It could be proceeding as a standalone bill, it could be up for a vote, and the vote could not go your way. Ideally, um, you've done your homework and you know that the vote is going to pass. And if you think that the vote is not going to pass, then ideally you have more time to work on it and work with the members of the committee. There's a question coming in about what is the most common fate of a bill. Um, there's probably somebody in the legislative reference li library that knows the precise answer to that. I would say from watching in committee hearings, the most common thing that you hear is this bill will be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill, which means that it has potential to move on, but you're not quite sure at that moment. We've got a question from within the room. Does having your bill included as part of an omnibus bill decrease its chances of moving forward, particularly if other pieces of the omnibus bill are being contested um, or are contentiously debated? Great question. I'd say it has a two-part answer. Omnibus bills usually pass, not always, but the big omnibus bills are put together with lots of compromising and lots of working with the various players to make sure that the omnibus bills will move forward to the end, and often they're finance bills, and if they don't move forward, then that portion of state government doesn't get financed, which has 
negative implications for lots and lots of people. So if your bill gets in the omnibus bill, because the omnibus bill is likely to move forward and pass, that would be a sign that that's, um, that's a, a positive sign for your bill. On the other hand, things can be traded in and out of omnibus bills, and so you can't rest on your laurels if you see that it's going to go to the omnibus bill. You need to understand that these are big and complicated bills, and sometimes in the end, in conference committee, which we'll get to in just a minute, there are trades if, um, if your bill made it into the omnibus bill in the Senate and not in the House, it might get traded out. So there are various ways that it can play out. Um, not all good. Okay, we'll move on. Um, the next step is when a bill passes out of a committee, um, it may go to another committee, as I've described, or it may go to the floor. And the floor means going to the House or the Senate for their full action. At the level of the House and the Senate, there are two, step, two steps. One is called second reading and one is called third reading. And basically, the, the reading is when they say out loud, your bill, House File 1, is having second reading, um, and that signals the next step in the process. Uh, typically, second and third readings happen on different days, although occasionally they happen on the same day if the majority and minority parties in that particular body decide to suspend their rules. Second reading is where the bill goes to the floor for significant debate and amendments. Not every bill has lots of debate and not every bill has amendments, but it's possible that when it goes to the floor, you'll find a lot of debate and amendments that change the intent or the scope of your proposal. Second reading is something that can last um, two minutes or hours and hours and hours. Um, and this is where you want to be paying very close attention to what is happening to your bill. In the House, and, excuse me, in the House, in the last legislative session, the DFL majority made a rule about amendments to bills that all amendments need to be what's called pre-filed 24 hours in advance of going to the floor. So in the past, it was possible that you would be surprised by amendments to your bill that would be just created spontaneously on the House floor or maybe saved for a gotcha moment. Um, but in the last biennium, there was a change. So the public is more able to be aware of what amendments are coming. And the current Republican majority has maintained that rule, rule in this legislative session. So you should be able to look in advance. There's a place on the website where you can see what amendments have been filed on your bill. At the end of second reading and the debate and amendments, they take a vote and it moves to third reading. Third reading is where people may make speeches and it may feel like a debate, but really people are stating their positions on the bill, why they support or oppose it, but there won't be amendments. This is the final debate on the bill and the final vote that signals whether the bill has passed or not passed. And if you think back to the coverage of things we've seen in recent years, you know, particularly I'd say the marriage equality question in Minnesota in 2013, um, there was a lot of news coverage of that, lots and lots of heartfelt speeches. This happens in third reading where people are indicating to the public why or why not they are uh, supporting or opposing a bill. Just as a little note, unlike in committee, there is no public testimony in the House and Senate on the floor. Only the legislators themselves can be engaged in that dialogue. I have a question, Susie. Sure. So I, I'm going to assume that our legislative champion is the legislative champion for lots of bills. Yes. And is carrying a lot of things. And I know that I'm the one shepherding and advocating for this thing. How, because I can't be on the floor and provide testimony during floor debates, how do I prepare my champion to do that on behalf of this issue. Sure, you're right, Renal. People introduce many, many bills, and some of them require um, a lot of work, and it's very helpful to the champion if you can be really tending to their needs as they are carrying the bill through the process. When, the, when your legislative champion is working on the floor for your bill and the debate is happening and amendments are happening, you can keep in touch with them in a couple of ways. Um, this, is the great, this is a great aspect of our 
um, electronic media environment that we can email them these days and we can text them and we um, often see from the gallery of the House and Senate floor that many, many legislators are engaging in some sort of media communications while they are doing their work on the floor. You can also do something called pulling your legislator off the floor where you go and talk to them um, and you send a note into the floor and you ask them to come out and talk to you and you can convey information to them that way, although you would never do that when they are fighting for your bill on the floor at that time because they have a very important job of seeing your bill through the process. Um, if people are interested in kind of what it looks like and the movement on the floor and in committees and, and how you might interact with legislators, we're doing another training called the Capital Lab on March 20th where we'll go a little bit deeper into that. Okay, the next step we'll move through here is congratulations, your bill passes. Um, if your bill passes off the floor after the third reading, there are a couple of things you'll need to consider. Is it moving concurrently in the other body? If it is, that's great. If it's not, you say thanks to your uh, champion in the one body where it moved and you run over and start working hard on the other body so it can move at the same time. Um, you need to do an assessment about whether there are differences between the House and the Senate bills. No doubt you introduce the same bill in both bodies, but throughout the process of amendments, it can change as it goes through the House and Senate process. And if there were amendments, you need to figure out, are these things that you can live with, or are you going to need to figure out if you can get rid of them so your bill will proceed cleanly as you had introduced it? Assuming that your bill has had some changes in either the House or Senate, so it's no longer a bill that's precisely matched, which is very common, you'll need to go to conference committee. Your bill will need to go to conference committee, and I recommend you go, too, to watch it. Um, if the House and Senate bills differ upon passage, they go to conference committee, which is a joint committee of House and Senate members specially called on a particular topic. These are very, very common uh, for omnibus bills because they're very complicated large bills and they always have changed, always have differences between the House and Senate. It is common that a conference committee would be made of um, maybe three or four members of the House and Senate, so maybe they're somewhere between six and eight or ten members total. They're called to do a specific job. They're named and called to do a specific job, which is iron out the differences. And it is common that the people who are named to the conference committee are people who have voted yes on the bill. So they're people who have signaled support on the bill. It would be less common that somebody who voted no for the bill would be invited to be on the negotiating committee to get it to its end. The conference committee meets maybe once, maybe ten times, it depends, to discuss the differences and agree on one final bill. When one final bill is agreed to, it goes back to the House and Senate floor for final passage and there, is, uh, there are no amendments allowed on final passage of the conference committee bill. In this stage in the process, you should be watching it very closely. For example, for Renal, if um, House File 1 and Senate File 1 started as identical bills, but in Senate File 1 they made an amendment that said all buses must stop at the railroad tracks except in Minneapolis where they can drive right through them, then Renal would need to work through that conference committee process to make sure that the final version wasn't the version with the Minneapolis amendment but that it was the version that was the clean bill as she had introduced it, or that the amendments that make it through conference committee are things that she can live with. And after it passes final passage on the House and Senate floor from conference committee, it heads to the governor, and we're almost done. So all bills, except constitutional amendments, which end up on the ballot, go to the governor, and this is the final step in a bill becoming a law. This is Kind of a huge accomplishment, actually. Of the over 3,000 bills that were introduced last year, only a few hundred made it to this point. So the question earlier about what's the most common fate of a bill is that it kind of dies somewhere in the process. Um, but if it's getting to the governor, that's a big deal. 
So obviously one of the things that should have been happening throughout this whole process and perhaps even an idea formation phase is working with the governor's office to make sure that the governor knows and supports the idea. At this point in the process, you don't want any surprises. You want to know that when it shows up on the governor's ceremonial signing desk, he's going to sign it, or she at some point, hopefully. Um, so the governor must take action on the bill within three days, and there is a few ways the governor could do this. The governor could sign it, and congratulations, you now have a new law. The governor could veto the bill. It could be a line item veto, and this can only be on specific spending items. Um, and it's basically a line that crosses out that spending number. The number cannot be changed. It's either in or it's out. The governor could also not take any action, in which case it becomes a law without the signature. So he could just sit on it and um, not take any action. This might happen in a situation where there is really broad public support, but for some reason the governor doesn't support the, the position, but he knows it should become law. Another option is at the end of the session, there's a flurry of activity generally and a lot of things that are passing off the floor. Um, so within the last three days of the biennium, the governor could pocket veto, and this would mean that he just, the governor just doesn't take any action. Um, and that triggers a whole other set of issues. So these are the options that the governor has. So let's assume that our school bus bill has passed um, and that is time to celebrate. So what we would do then is to thank all of the people that we worked with very early on in the process uh, and celebrate with them. We thank our legislators and the staff that we worked with and thank anybody else who helped us along the way. Take a minute to celebrate. But the, our work isn't done yet. So the next part, which I think often is not thought a whole lot about or planned for, is implementation. So depending what our new law does, there might be substantial implementation duties or nuances. There might be whole sets of new regulations that an agency, a governmental agency or department has to draft up. And we want to make sure that we follow this process through its conclusion to ensure that everything is working in the way that we intended and that the way that we had talked about to make sure that our initial idea has the impact that we had sought for it to have. So that's kind of the end of our formal presentation. Um, please submit any questions that you have that have come up throughout the webinar. Some resources we want to point out is we have a module on the MCN Advocacy Resources website where the following links are included to places like Health Information, the Chief Clerk's Office, Senate Information, the Revisor's Office that has a really great guide on how to draft a bill, and the Minnesota Legislative Library. Um, so this is, these are some additional resources if you want to keep getting into um, how this process works. And we would like to offer additional MCN generated resources. First of all, ourselves, Renal and I are happy to be a resource to consult with you to answer your questions on the phone or by email or come talk to your organization or your board about the kind of the things that you're considering as you're putting together your advocacy plan and thinking about how to develop your idea into action. Also, I'd like to call your attention to a couple more trainings that we have in our spring advocacy training series. The next one is also a webinar on March 6th building relationships with elected officials. And following that, on March 20th, is an active um, on-site training at the Capitol called Capitol Lab. It's from 10 a.m. to noon on March 20th. And you can join Renal and I for some time at the Capitol where we can take a look at committee hearing rooms, we can see the legislative chambers, and we'll talk to you about how the system works from being within that environment and getting a feel for how you move around the process at the Capitol. Also, we'll send you an email later today which will have these resources and an evaluation survey, and we hope that you will fill that out and give us feedback so we can have 
continuous improvement. And within the next two weeks, the recording of this webinar will be on our website in case you'd like to listen to it again or know others who would like to do so. There's a question from Deborah about the pocket veto. So admittedly, this is something that also confuses me and took me a little while to understand because it's different when the governor doesn't take any action in which the bill becomes a law without a signature, right? So earlier on, before the end of the biennium, when a governor doesn't take action, it just becomes law by default. At the end of the biennium, um, in the last three days of the session, if a governor doesn't take any action, effectively it acts as a veto. Susie, has this happened in well, recent years? I'll add, I don't, I don't know the answer to whether that specifically has happened in recent years, but this is a rare fate. Both of these are rare fates for bills. Typically, um, by the time it's gotten through the floor and the conference committees, you've worked with the governor's office to be assured that it will be signed, or perhaps the governor chooses to veto the bill, but the, the two no action options for the governor are rare. I'll also just say one last thing about the governor is that if you saw in a previous photo, a few slides back, the photo of the governor signing something with people standing behind him, you may get invited to a signing ceremony and you should go. The governor, um, all, governors over all kinds of time from all the, the various parties um, invite the champions of bills to join him or someday her for the celebration, which includes the signing of the bill, um, and it's a great honor to be a part of that. So we thank you very much for your interest in this topic, and we encourage all nonprofits to think about using their um, knowledge and experience in the community to generate the good ideas that might become the great laws in Minnesota in the future. We're here to help you navigate that process and we encourage you to be in touch as you have questions or would like support, and we wish you the best of luck as you carry forth with your advocacy work on behalf of the communities you serve. Thank you.